everyone. I want to introduce you to James Garrett. He is a brain coach and founder of Brain by Design. He's spoken on stages ranging from Harvard to TEDx, and his work has been featured by the New York Times, Fast Company, and Harvard Business Review. He spent years doing research with some of the best psychologists in the world at Columbia, Tufts, and Yale. He's a content creator and course builder, and his course called Brain Science for Coaches has been rated as one of the best courses for coaches and is currently certified by ICF for 30 continuing coach education credits. More about that later. Um, he's a certified coach through the Whole Fit Coaching Program. He has also built one of the only brain-based positive psychology curricula in the Middle East and trained thousands of Arab youth in partnership with Queen Rania of Jordan. A rare combination of scientist, trainer, and entrepreneur, in 2019, James launched the Deep Change Project, a personal journey to discover what's possible at the outer edges of neuroplasticity and to overcome fear. I am a neuroscience geek and super excited to hear more. Welcome, Karen, James. Thank you so much, Karen. Thank so you. so kind of you. Thank you for the kind introduction. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, I know you've got family and home obligations, and I'm cutting into your evening. Um, so just grateful. Hopefully, we can get this done by dinner. Um, but grateful for spending the time. And uh, this is a really interesting topic, one I, I really do hope will help you with your own clients, um, as well as in your own life. Um, <clears throat> habits end up being just universally valuable in terms of mastering this basic skill set uh, of habits. So let me just jump, if I can, to... Uh... Okay. Can everyone see that okay? Just get a thumbs up if I can see the slides. Yep. Okay, great. All right, I just want to start with this question, which uh, I assume is pretty natural, which is what, why habits? What good have habits been in your life? What's the value of habits? Any thoughts on this? Again, feel free to just unmute yourself um, and talk. Hey, James, thanks for being with us today. Um, I, one habit that one note I have about habit I'm interested to hear everyone's thoughts on is the idea that um, we can't, or at least with my clients, I say, don't worry about changing anything you already believe. Let's just build new habits. Hmm. That's a thought I have on habits. So not resisting the kind of working against just kind of going forward instead of looking back. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Hi, this was, is Marsha. Go ahead, Hi. Marcia. Hi. Yeah, I talk a lot about habits in, in my work and that so much of our day, I forget what the percentage is, like 80% of our day is governed by habits because if we had to rethink everything new, it would be difficult to make it through the day. So most of the time, habits are good. It's routine. It gives us a sense of satisfaction. We don't really like change, especially if it's not dramatic. So habits give us a sense of comfort. Yes, of course, there can be bad habits and good habits. And habits are hard to change. They are. We have to sell the benefits of that change. <laughs> I like that. We got to sell the benefits because they're hard. You got to sell the benefits of the change because it's going to be, this isn't an easy road, right? It's the yeah. road maybe less traveled. Because like the brain it. likes pleasure. So if it's a hard thing to do and there's no benefit to it, why would I do it? But for instance, if let's say I'm very overweight and I imagine the pleasure I'm going to get when I look really good or fit into that special dress for my granddaughter's wedding, let's say, that's going to give me mm. pleasure. So I might be willing to change those eating habits in order to achieve that pleasure. Good. Good. Thank you, both Marsha and Eric. Both really, really valuable points. I appreciate that. Yeah, Minx, please. So one of the things that I teach is a program. My background is in nutrition way before I became a coach and I became a coach 20 years ago. So I've been at this a long time mm -hmm. and I teach a course called habits before diets or before any food program, because just the process of sitting down, paying attention, saying grace before you eat and eating mindfully, putting your fork down between bites, all of that will have a far greater impact than any specific food that you're eating. 
So there's a process and people are astounded because people don't pay attention. They sit down and Mm. there's food served. They don't know if it's the right portion for them, but they just start eating and talking and getting distracted. And so they get into old habits instead of building habits that support health. Very good. Good. I'm sure I'm sure Brian Wansink's work on mindless eating is it right down your alley. There's so much really interesting research around. Yeah, we do eat mindlessly, right? Especially when we get distracted, which what is socializing, but some kind of like we're doing this socializing thing while automatically shoveling, right? <laughs> um, good. I like it. Anybody else? Thank you, Minx. I appreciate that. I like to um I like to tie habits to um, not necessarily good or bad Mm. perspective, just kind of create a little bit of acceptance, but also dig in a little bit as to whether there's consciousness of those habits Mm -hmm. um, in the moment that they're happening, which I think many of us and kind of goes to the mind, mindful eating and mindful perspective in life. Um, A lot of what we do is not tied to mindfulness. And so I, I try to tie it to, I try to kind of bring a bit of consciousness around the habits. So, you know, what do you want? Do you want this? Do you not want this? Um, mm. You know, how, how can you show up for yourself when you see that you're about to go down a path of following a habit that you actually are not interested in following anymore, whatever habit it might be. So um, honing in on it and not making it um, a bad thing, not being judgmental about it, which is what I think is the first thing we all tend to do about habits. Mm. Shakti, thank you so much for that. It's a perfect kind of setup for for everything that we're going to be talking about because they are kind of mindless habits, right? When they're really well formed, so bringing that elevated consciousness or awareness to them is critical in changing them. Um, it's it's a it's a bit of a paradox these habit things, right? Your your brain is kind of this habit making machine. Um, it will make habits with or without your permission. Um, It does it automatically and unconsciously in the background. Uh, And um, there's a good reason your, your brain's not, your brain's no dummy. It's not, it's not uh, doing this uh, because it's, you know, has some thing for habits without good reason. It has, has quite good reason for why it builds habits automatically and unconsciously. And the reason is they take less energy. They're just straight up more efficient. So decisions, which take place in the conscious part of our brains, right? Decisions are um, here on this graph. So easy on the vertical axis, you've got hard at the top, easy at the bottom. Horizontal axis, you've got these two different kind of realms of uh, human experience, the conscious realm and the unconscious or subconscious. Um, Decisions are hard and conscious. So they take place, decision-making largely takes place in the, it's called the prefrontal cortex, the kind of CEO of the brain, the kind of, uh, they call them executive functions. Um, And it's a lot of mental work to make decisions. So anytime your brain can turn a behavior from a decision into a habit, which runs in a completely different part of the the brain, which is more subconscious, more unconscious, non-conscious, there's three different ways to refer to that. Uh, part of the brain or really that experience of of being, uh, it will, all right? So your brain, think of it like this, brain's really transporting a behavior from being taken care of by this heavy, expensive, energy, inefficient part of the brain, which is your prefrontal cortex, to this more energy efficient cheaper from an energy perspective part of the brain. It's your basal ganglia, your dorsal striatum. There's a sort of suite of areas that that work together to to form habits. That's it. Your brain's an energy scrooge. That's the whole underlying. So, So think of it like this. You have your own agenda as a human, your own priorities, your own goals, your clients, same thing. And then your brain has its priorities. And sometimes those things work together beautifully, and sometimes they're totally at odds. To, to um, I think Shakti brought this up, th- th- your brain is really habit agnostic. It's not good or bad to your brain. 
it's really, is this a decision, which is energy expensive, or is this a habit, energy inexpensive? And if it's energy expensive, I'm going to find a way to turn make that energy inexpensive by turning it into a habit. I don't care if that's going through the drive through every day after work for dinner, or whether that's, you know, eating a green smoothie for breakfast every day. It's just, it's not good or bad to your brain in terms, it's whether it's efficient or inefficient. So again, sometimes this works with us. You know, how it's by default would be like the uh, going, you know, it, on the way home from work through the drive through every day, perhaps. Um, you don't intend to make that a habit, but your brain, after doing it a few times, spots a pattern and says, ah, that decision we keep making about swinging through the, uh, you know, in and out or the, you know, whatever the favorite place is on the way, the wafting smell of French fries. Um Let's uh, let's just turn that into a habit. So these are habits by default. We've all have them. We all have them pretty much in our lives. Um, and the question is, how do we shift from habits by default to habits by design? How do we get that habit making machinery that will automatically and unconsciously be forming these habits again, with or without our permission? Doesn't ask. It just does it in the background. How do we get intentional? about that process? How do we actually grab the steering wheel of that process and actually direct that habit-making process in, in the direction of our goals, align it with our values and our goals and what the outcomes we want in our life? This is the real shift. Um, to be clear, this shift that we're talking about is a skill set. So this becoming like a habit designer or habit architect, sometimes I like the word architect. There's this there's this great quote by Gretchen Rubin, wonderful science writer, who said, uh, habits are the invisible architecture of our everyday lives. Um, Wendy Wood, one of the form world's foremost experts on habits, she's at the University of Southern California, professor. She estimate, she and her team estimate that about 43% of our daily behavior comes from a place of habit. So it's not quite half of what we do every day it comes automatically and unconsciously, but almost have. So again, that's a lot of behavior. That's a lot of doing that's running unconsciously and automatic. Um, and again, to, to uh, Shakti's point about it being automatic, that is both the power and the peril of habits is that they run in the unconscious. That's why they're so energy inexpensive. It's also why they're so sticky and hard to change. All right. Any guesses on this, how long a new habit takes to form? Six weeks. Six weeks, Marcia, good guess. Anybody else feel free to put it. It was 21, 21 days. Wasn't that the original number? It takes 21 days to change a habit. 21 days, good guess, Minx, I like it. That's the most common answer I get, actually. Who else? Shakti, please. Uh, I <laughs> would, yeah, I would think more like, um, I actually don't know the answer, but I think it's like a few months at least, like two to three months. Okay. All right, good. Anybody else? I, I think it's a year. Take up almost. A year, yeah. Okay, good. So we've got 21 days, three weeks, up to 365 days a full year. That's a, cool, that's a good range. All right, so scientists have finally dialed this in. Um, and we understand now that it takes, on average, as an average, about 66 days to form. Now, bad news is it takes even more time for harder habits. Um, exercise is a good example. Exercise, they've teased this one out. And exercise takes around 91 days, interestingly. Um, whereas mini habits, we'll get to mini habits in a bit, but mini habits take about a month, according to BJ Fogg, the main research behind tiny habits. So I think it's a, a good assessment based on the research to, to assume that, that uh, one to three months is kind of the range, roughly speaking. And on average, it's around two months, 66 days. Uh, easier habits, of course, um, a little bit less. All right, why does it take so long? Because that's, that's like disappointing. <laughs> 21 days actually makes like let let I'm in for I, or, or Marcia said that. Was it Marcia or Mink, Mink said that? Mink. Uh, um 21 days sounds great. I wish it were 21 days. Um the question is why isn't it? What's going on in the brain? Why does it take so long? 
So this is the Nevada desert between Los Angeles and Las Vegas. Uh, this is not Florida. <laughs> <laughs> like the anti-Florida, you know, um, barren desert, sagebrush, tumbleweed. Um, it's, it's dry. And um, I-15 is the freeway that connects Los Angeles to Las Vegas. I want you to just imagine you're driving on I-15. I want you to, in your mind's eye, pull over to the shoulder of I-15 and actually physically start driving on the sagebrush. Look at literally what you're seeing. What happens to the speed of the car? Slows down. Gets Slows bumpy. Down, gets bumpy. <clears throat> what else is good? Anything else? It Uncomfortable. Feel, it doesn't feel good. Yeah. Uncomfortable? Yeah. It, it's like, oh, shoot. <laughs> but you've got to slow down or you're going to lose a wheel. Everything changes, it, but mostly it's uncomfortable. It's awkward. It's painful. The conversation you were having with your friend or significant other stops. You're like, I just got to focus. I can't talk right now. Turning the radio way down. Like everything about this experience is very different than driving on the freeway. However, if you keep driving on that random patch of desert, Eventually, this will happen. Now, it's not overnight, you know, and it's not, you know, an amazing difference, but it is, tire tracks do make a difference. And you can go maybe 15 miles an hour instead of five. Now, if enough cars start doing this, and this starts happening over and over, maybe hundreds of cars per day start following the same path, eventually that will smooth out even more and you've got something like a fully formed dirt road. Now at this point, again, it's nothing to write home about. If anybody's driven on a long dirt road knows that it's still a little bumpy, but you know, you can do 25 or 30 miles an hour pretty, pretty easily, which is way better than five. Again, it's not what you can do on a freeway, but it's improvement. Now, I want you to imagine the Nevada Department of Transportation office is looking at their satellite images and John like, you know, elbowing Jerry and being like, hey, Jerry, like there's this random dirt road, like every day, same thing, dust like crazy. There's hundreds of cars driving on this thing every day. What do you think we should do about it? And Jerry's like, well, it's in the budget. Should we just pave it? And John's like, let's do it. So they make a decision to allocate resources to this really used dirt road in order to make traveling on it easier. Now, the reason, the logic behind why they did that has everything to do with the use. Without actual use, it wouldn't have been a good idea, a, a, a wise use or investment of resources. But since there's so much traffic on it, it makes sense to pave it. Now, this can happen and even expand into a multi-lane freeway. Again, if there's enough demand, enough use, it's worth it to invest resources. Without that, it really isn't. So what does this have to do with our brains? Our brains are a complex interconnected system of neural two-lane tire tracks, dirt roads, two-lane highways, and six-lane freeways. These are called neural pathways. And some of them are really easy to travel on. And some of them are really obnoxiously difficult to travel on. They're still there. You can still drive a car down them. But they're kind of like these little squeaky neighborhood roads where you can go like max 25 miles an hour. Now, I want you to imagine going like in Miami, you know, point A to point B across the entire city. Assuming there's no traffic, which sounds like it <laughs> sounds like a dream, <laughs> but let's just assume there's no traffic. <laughs> Maybe it's 3 a.m., right? Um, if you were to try to get from point A to point B across the entire city, what would you take? The freeway. Of course, because it's the most efficient way to travel. No stoplights. You can go, I don't know what the speed limit is in South Florida, maybe 65 or 70. 
Um, but you can go really fast, no stoplights, and you can get from point A to point B in maybe 20 or 30 minutes, depending, right? Now, if you were to try, try to do that same route, but actually go through these kind of winding neighborhood roads, much like you're seeing kind of at the top of this picture here, let me just adjust that. Um, you know, you can get there through these, you know, roundabout oblique pathways. It's just gonna take way longer. Maybe take it two hours instead of 20 minutes. Um, again, it's not impossible. It's just not that efficient. So your brain is actually under operating under the exact same principles in terms of why it does what it does. The, the neural pathways that are incredibly robust, incredibly reinforced, incredibly powerful, like a six lane freeway, it defaults to traveling on those freeways because it's more energy efficient. Not necessarily because it's good for you, not necessarily because it's creating the outcomes you want in your life, but just simply because those neural pathways are simply easier to travel on. So let me give you a quick example. So brushing your teeth with your dominant hand looks like a six lane freeway, just like the one in the middle you're seeing here. Try brushing your teeth with your non-dominant hand tonight and you'll feel exactly what I'm saying. It's more like one of these neighborhood roads. Maybe it's a two lane highway, but, but for me, it's more like one of these neighborhood roads. It's incredibly awkward. I can do it. I'm coordinated enough to get around every awkward angle, but I really got to think about it. You will be shocked at how uncoordinated you feel when you brush with your non-dominant hand as opposed to your dominant hand. What's the difference? The strength of the neural pathways that are responsible for those particular motor movements for those two differing hands. That's it. That's it. So again, habits are the equivalent of strong, robust, on a neurological level, are strong, robust neural pathways. All right, how do they get so strong? This is, by the way, a lovely, gorgeous illustration of neural pathways in the brain. So we're moving from metaphor to neuroscience here. And I just wanna zoom in even deeper onto the, le onto the level of a single neuron. Okay, I promise, I promise, I promise this is as complicated as we're gonna get. This picture here. Um, this is what neurons look like. They look like trees. So the cells of our brain aren't circular like the kind of models we made in high school, you know, with the nucleus and the ribosomes and the, you know, the mitochondria and, you know, no, no, they're trees. They look like trees. So if I was a giant, you could go outside and rip out a tree and turn it sideways. That's what neurons look like. And neurons are, of course, the cells of our brain. You have, scientists have gotten really good at this number. We have on average about 86 billion of them in our brain, behind, between our ears, in this cavity here. <laughs> um, so no kidding, every single one of us has a neural brain forest. It's wildly dense in there because every single neuron has up to 10,000 branches, just like a tree. So this is a very oversimplified depiction of a neuron. What you're seeing on the branches, that they're called dendrites, uh, you're seeing, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you're seeing like 15 or 20 right there. No, that's not what they actually look like. There's five to 10,000 per neuron. So they're bushy, exactly like a tree. Um, then you've got the trunk of the tree. It's called the axon, which is the longest part of the neuron. And then at the end, it's cut off here, but at the very end, you've got the roots where the neurotransmitters, the actual neurochemicals, the messengers of your nervous system, squirt out into the synaptic cleft or, cleft or gap between the neurons and connect with the next neuron and the signal continues. So all that's to say, again, trying to keep this as, as, as high level as possible. All that's to say is along the trunk of the tree, the trunk of the neuron, there's this really awesome material called myelin sheath. So of course, a lot of you know about myelin. Myelin's really awesome. If you wanna read a really great book about myelin, it's called The Talent Code by Daniel Coyle. I'm so sure some of you have read about it, read it, read it. Um, but myelin is like the pavement in our analogy. So what happens? You're trying to create, create a new habit. Well, let's take the example of brushing. Let's say I break my right hand and I have to brush with my left hand. I did that. Yeah. Sometimes we have to learn new 
coordinated co coordination, right, with our with our movements. Um, this will take time, and this will take longer than typically a habit will take. But over time, the the actual movements will become smoother. It's just like a like a baby learning to walk. I've got a two two year old right now, so like it wasn't that long ago that he was learning to walk. Um, it becomes better and better and better over time. Why does it become smoother, those motor movements? It's not completely, but largely because of myelin. So you've got this, they're literally like construction workers. You have this entire subset of cells called oligodendrocytes. They're called oligos in the lab. And they sit around and they wait and they say, hey, what's James gonna do today? And indeed, I get up and go for the run. Or indeed, I, you know, open the fridge and grab the green smoothie for breakfast or what, whatever it is. And they go, and then I do the thing, right? And then the oligos, they're like the pavers. They literally, literally wrap another single layer of myelin around those neurons that get used. And then they go back and sit and wait to see what I'll do next. And the deeper that myelin gets, these rings of myelin, the more efficient that neuron becomes, the stronger that neural pathway is. I mean, myelin largely is insulation for the neuron and it changes how fast a neuron fires. So without myelin, neurons fire at about two miles an hour. And with myelin, fully myelinated, and it gets 50 plus layers deep in these rings of myelin sheath or these sort of Almost like a tree, almost like tree rings. You can think of it a little bit like that. Um, it can get up to, it can go from two miles an hour to up to 200 miles an hour when it's fully myelinated. So again, without myelin, two miles an hour, fully myelinated, 200 miles an hour. There's a hundredfold difference between a neuron functioning, you know, at its lowest capacity versus its highest capacity hundredfold difference in terms of the speed and power, raw processing power of a single neuron. So you start seeing embedded in the nervous system is the capacity to change itself, to make certain behaviors more easy over time. This is the power of habits and it's deep. It's not just that we feel like they're easier. They actually are easier. The behavioral experience of doing something over and over, like brushing my teeth with my dominant hand feels easier but the reason is because of myelin sheath. All right. High level, this is what it looks like going down the axon, right? These are the rings of myelin, just so you can kind of visually see what that looks like. But the big picture here is your brain is just like a muscle. The areas of the brain that get exercised or used the most get strengthened and the ones that don't get weakened. So this is the science of neuroplasticity, the way brains change, um, and it underlies everything about habits and habit formation. All right, there's this great quote by William James. It's really the kind of um, father of modern American psychology. He said, you wanna make your nervous system your ally instead of your enemy. He wrote a lot about habits, not surprisingly. But again, nervous systems are primed to build habits all the time in the background of our lives. The only question is which habits are we building? It's not like it's gonna stop building habits just because we don't want it to build habits. It's gonna keep doing it. But the question is who's in control, who's driving or steering that habit forming process? Is it happening unconsciously and automatically like a default process? Or are we actually intentionally creating and architecting those beautiful behaviors that over time create the kinds of outcomes we want in our lives. All right, I'm making this sound a little, a little, uh, a little easy, right? It's like 60, okay, 66 days. I just get in the driver's seat of my habit making machinery and boom, I'm on the, off to the races. Done, check, sign me up. There's a couple of challenges when it comes to forming habits. They're, they're sneaky, they're tricky, they're slippery. Um, here's where we get tripped up. Number one, and this is really important for clients to understand these potential pitfalls with habits, because again, if we set them up, it's a, it's a bit of a paradox. We want to encourage them 
in, 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 in and invest in what they're excited to change in their lives and simultaneously hold up the challenges and obstacles that they're inevitably going to hit. Both things are critical to a change process. All right. Motivation is unreliable. So it's like up and down, up and down, up and down. It's a bit like a roller coaster. So people feel really uh, unmotivated sometimes, myself included, and they don't know why. And they sometimes think they're, I don't know, lazy, being slothful. I mean, there's plenty of choice words we use when we get into these states referring to ourselves when none of that is actually accurate. Biologically, that's just what happens with the human body during the day. We have periods of high energy and low energy. They call these ultradian rhythms, technically. They're called U-L-T-R-A, ultradian rhythms. Um, we have about 90 minutes of good energy and about a 20-minute trough. 90 minutes of good energy and a 20-minute trough. It goes it cycles. It actually mirrors our nighttime sleep cycles, but they're daytime energy cycles. So the body is constantly oscillating. Now, when you have good energy, ride it. It's amazing. This will happen in, in about a month and a half with New Year's resolutions. Watch. Everyone get this massive motivation wave. It's amazing. Ride it. Like surf that thing as long as you can. But just know that within a little while, it's going to come crashing down. And without systems to pick you back up, you'll lose the motivation. It's just the nature of motivation. It's just, a, it's a great fuel source. It's just not a consistent or reliable fuel source. All right, second problem. So will, motivation is about the gas or the, motive, the, the sort of accelerator of the brain, the, the go, sometimes called the go system, the uh, approach system of the brain. Willpower is about the stopping system, the uh, inhibition or impulse control system. And the problem with willpower is that it's an exhaustible resource. It's like your cell phone battery. It's great while it's working. You start getting kind of nervous when it's like 7%, right? <laughs> and you've got like, I don't know, four hours left in the day. You know it's going to die before the end of the day. Welcome to willpower. Ever notice how much harder Ben and Jerry's is to resist at 10 p.m. than 10 a.m.? <laughs> like every day of the week, right? And you're not a different person. You don't have different goals. It's just a different time of day. Your willpower has run out. You've used it up throughout the day. So this obviously brings up really important guideposts in a behavior change process. One is that nighttime is absolutely where you'll be most vulnerable and your weakest, most susceptible to temptation of a million different varieties, whether it's the Ben and Jerry's or the Netflix binging or the social media doom scrolling or whatever. Like whatever, you know, um, not because you don't care about your goals, not because, but, 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 but again, finding ways around those vulnerabilities and working with them rather than just assuming that I'm the same person with the same strong willpower all day long. That's in a lovely, but just, it's a myth. It's a lovely myth, but it's just a myth. All right. How do you get around these traps? We'll spend the next portion of our time together on this really cool tool that BJ Fogg really put good research around, but it's called tiny habits or mini habits. All right, so what are these mini habits and how do they solve these various challenges and pitfalls or potholes of habit formation? Um, BJ Fogg had a problem. By the way, I should... I should pull this off the shelf in case anybody is interested. This is the this is BJ Fogg's book, Tiny Habits. I'm sure some of you've read it. It's a great book, great read. Um, BJ Fogg had a problem. According to himself, he wasn't doing enough exercise. Not my assessment, his. And he wanted to do more. And like I would guess that many of us have been in that boat. Um. And then he started wondering why he always failed at his, 
you know, attempts at changing his own behavior. I mean, here's a guy, a professor of behavior change, of psychology at Stanford University of all places. One of the, no, actually it's the number one psychology program in the world. And he can't get himself to change his own behavior. I mean, this is a real problem. It's embarrassing, if nothing else. And so he's trying to like puzzle this out. So he starts looking for clues as a good scientist would. What am I doing? He goes, well, based on the last, you know, number of years of my New Year's resolutions, I'm definitely going big. You know, most of my uh, attempts are kind of a big go, go big or go home, you know, approach. You know, something that's uh, Facebook or Instagram worthy to post, you know, something uh, kind of uh, impressive. And uh, it just fails by February every time. So he's like, well, maybe that's the problem. Maybe I'm just doing too much all at once. Maybe I need to go smaller instead of bigger. Maybe really small. Maybe so small it feels like weird or even embarrassing. Like, so what's that good that that going to do? He's just like, I'm curious. I'm going to try it out. So here's his first tiny habit. He does two push-ups after he goes pee every time. All right. Not, again, wasn't my mini habit. That was his. But this is how it starts. He goes to the bathroom, does his two push-ups, back to the office. A couple hours later, goes to the bathroom, does his two push-ups, back to the office. I don't know, by the way, he's never clarified if he did it in the bathroom or at his office. I hope it was in his office, but I'm just saying, um, one of these days I'm gonna ask him. Uh, but that's it. Two push. So, so, so the first couple of weeks he's doing 15 to tw- six, you know, 16 to 20 pushups a day, roughly. But then he starts, starts to notice something changes about week three and he starts doing like 50 pushups a day. And then by the end of the month, the first month, it's over hundred pushups a day. He's in triple digits. So first thing he notices is the habit starts growing. Well, that's cool. I mean, it's not nothing, you know, it's still not probably getting, uh, you know, sculpted arms from, uh, from, from, from it, but it is more than I was doing. And the second thing he noticed is he never missed. He would always do it. And that is probably the more important of the two is he just consistency reigned supreme. He just never missed. It was just too dang easy to do it. And so all that resistance and pushback and like uh, putting off or procrastinating, it just didn't occur to him because it was so simple. He just did the two pushups and went on his way. He flipped what most of us do, which is focus on intensity. He flipped it for consistency. We'll get into that in just a sec. But here's what he found. He brought hundreds and then thousands of people into his lab and studied them in their home environments. And he realized, oh, behavior change has these different dimensions to it. Here they are. On the, ver- on the vertical axis, you can see there's motivation, right? So you've got high motivation at the top, low motivation at the bottom. There's like a continuum between the two. And along the horizontal axis, you've got hard to do on the left, easy to do on the right. Uh, and again, it's just a continuum. All successful behavior change attempts follow this nice green curve is what his data has shown. Everything up and to the right is a successful attempt at changing a habit. Everything down and to the left is an unsuccessful attempt at changing a habit. Let me give you a quick example. If you were to try to drink a glass of water, let's say, right? Fill up your water bottle in the morning, put it on your nightstand, wake up in the morning, drink it, just a, way, just a way to rehydrate first thing. For most of us, that's a fairly simple behavior. Fill it up on the fridge or your filter, water filter, or whatever. Um, for most of us, you're gonna be able to, it's on this side of that easy to do continuum. So it doesn't take that much motivation to cross over that green threshold. Now, the further left you go, and it gets harder and harder, let's call it getting to the gym for 45 minutes, the more and more motivation you're going to need to successfully cross over that green threshold. Does that make sense how the relationship dynamically uh, works, right? Between motivation and difficulty. Um, And not only that, with the 45 minute workout or an hour workout at the gym, 
you're going to need consistently high motivation. So again, I hope you're seeing that, oh, already that might be a problem because maybe some days or some moments, at least, you're going to have low motivation just because that's the nature of motivation. All right. Again, everything down and to the left, unsuccessful. We'll get back to that graph in just a sec, I promise. Any guesses on this? How many New Year's resolutions fail every year? I mean, we're a month and a half away, guys. 95%. 95 percent oh shoot oh woo. anybody else 75 75 who else is good i think marsh is right i think 95 percent fail Sh shortly thereafter within a month within a month all right all right well not bad not bad <laughs> Yeah, the data show it's about 92%. Um, this is uh, some studies that I'm quoting here. Uh, some other studies also looking at the same question have shown about 88. It's at least a B plus or an A minus in terms of how we're doing on the failure of our New Year's resolutions. It's bad. Invert that. How successful we're doing at our New Year's resolutions? Yeah, we're getting an 8%, like on the uh, how the uh, how the habit behavior change attempts go this year. 8%. Have you ever got an 8% on a test? That's like one answer right out of everything. I mean, it's so bad. It's like an F minus, 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 minus. That's a wild, that number is so wild. Not only because um, we, we all know it to be true, like 95 just like popped out of our mouths, right? Because we've all experienced and seen this so much in our lives. But it's more interesting because be brains are highly malleable and changeable based on the neuroplasticity research I just described. So what is the missing piece? If we can change, how come we don't change? It's too hard. It's hard to do and we're not that motivated. It's easy to say you're going to do it. That's easy. <laughs> that doesn't take effort. But when you really have to start doing it, then it is hard and it doesn't bring you pleasure right away. Yeah. We find things that bring us pleasure, we're more apt to buy into it. Good. And then we've I got know. old habits that are running the show that are hard to break. Good. Probably yes. also a big, a really big goal that that has like a ton of different facets to it. And and we're just trying to get to that big thing without really maybe focusing on the, the aspects, the smaller steps. Yeah. Yes. All of those are working against it. What I've come to and all of those are very uh, difficult things to overcome. However, there's a bigger invisible picture here when it comes to why we're unsuc collective on, in, the, on, in the aggregate together as a group, like humans in general, like we're not doing so hot at this behavior change thing. The main reason is because there's a skill set involved. Behavior change is just a skill set. And I don't know about you, but I was too busy learning algebra in school to like study behavior change 101, right? I mean, like, think about this. Like we don't teach kids behavior change 101 or how to have form positive habits. And it's like one of the most important skill sets they could ever acquire. And we don't even like think of teach, like where do you learn? You don't. We just don't learn this. Think, think of like a reg, like a skill set we, we intuitively understand. Like my, my, um, my nine-year-old right now is uh, just starting the violin. It's kind of squeaky in my house right now. <laughs> um, not kind of, it's really squeaky. And when it squeaks, man, it is. I mean, she's really proud of herself and I'm proud of her for, you know, working at it, but I'm not loving the sound, you know? Um, and if I put in front of her something like, oh, I don't know. Uh, Pocket bills can't I, like like I don't know some some favorite classical piece like Mozart's Magic Flute or just some some some, some thing right so, some hard to play piece, um, and I'm like no sweetie seriously just just play it. I love this piece, play it. I just want to hear it. You'd be like, hey dude, she's on Twinkle Twinkle. Like give her some time, and I'm like no no, but I love it. you. Just like it's so obvious. There's a missing skill set, you know, and it takes years to master that skill set. 
And when it comes to sports and music and academics and language learning, you know, we know this, it's intuitive. But when it comes to habit formation, we just assume it's all up to our like willpower and white knuckling. That's a problem. Because we don't necessarily embrace our clients and say, hey, or, or engage our clients and say, what's really needed here is to buckle down and build a brick at a time, this skill set of habit formation and behavior change. Once you get good at that, mastering that skill set, then everything starts changing. All the doors start opening up for you because you get good at behavior change as a skill set in the same way that you get good at playing piano through practice. All right. One of the biggest problems when it comes to New Year's resolutions, the reason they fail so often is because most people start in the top left corner of this graph by BJ Fogg, which is just to say, go big or go home. I'm, I'm not kidding, like watch, watch social media. Even if you're not on social media, just hop on just during the first week of January, just check it out. Every third person will be at the gym. I mean, maybe not every third, but like every fifth, it's a lot. The point is people are super motivated. They're all excited. They're like, this year is the year for my six pack or whatever, you know, exciting thing they have in their mind. And then life happens. You know, sometimes they're on the wagon. Sometimes they're off. Sometimes they're on. Sometimes they're off. They're on again. Then family comes into town. They're on again. Then one of the kids gets sick. They're on again. And then they feel just discouraged for a week because they got deadlines at work. Whatever it is. Curveballs. Normal stuff. And they feel so discouraged by all the like, you know, I think that like motivational whiplash. They're super excited and they're really depressed. You know, it's up and down, up and down, up and down. All right. Many habits are like, whoa, 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 whoa. Opposite corner. Let's start in the bottom right. Where it's easy. Consistency is like literally no big deal because it's so simple. You'll always do it because it's still, it kind of seems silly not to do it because it's just so simple. And then let's work backwards and see if we can actually end up there. But let's not start there. How does this happen? Why do many habits work when other habit strategies tend to fail? Number one, many habits build consistency. I've already alluded to this in many different ways, but this is one of the reasons, one of the most important reasons why they work so well is they don't focus on intensity, they focus on consistency. So it's a lovely, lovely quote. It's Will Durant summarizing Aristotle. He said, we are what we repeatedly do. What we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. Consistency is how we change, consistency. So there's this, again, this kind of tension between consistency and intensity. Intensity is really important. And when I say intensity, I mean, you know, really powerful experiences, like a weekend retreat where you have really, really uh, important insight into uh, changes you wanna make in your life. Hmm? That's a good thing. It's not, not a good thing, it is a good thing, but it isn't the stuff of habit formation. It's the stuff of insight uh, motivation and inspiration, but not necessarily transformation. It's, it, it doesn't necessarily change us or, or, or change the neural pathways to create new defaults over time. So again, it's not that it's bad. It can be a spark for a really important new change we're making, but habits don't tend to happen in experiences of intensity. They happen in experiences of consistency. So think of it like this. In those two realms, consistency beats intensity every time. Let me give you a quick example. These are my exercise clothes. You know, they're not, not much to look at, but uh, notice where they are. This seemed like not that big of a deal. This was, so by the way, I was trying to do a new morning uh get out the door and move my legs habit um, uh, beginning of 2019. And one of the little mini habits I did was putting these exercise clothes right where you see them. Now, 
this did a couple of things for me. Number one, I would wake up in some a semi-fogged, semi-half dream, half awake sleep state and peel one eye open and boom, there they are. So instantly it activated a trigger, a reminder, a prompt that the next step I'm supposed to take that I set up for myself is to get my butt out the door. That was it. Like though that my brain knows that that's what that means. And it's a physical object that reminds me to do something. The other thing it does is it reduces friction. So again, it's cold. Well, <laughs> sorry, it's cold. It's cold where I am. I'm in New Hampshire, you guys. <laughs> but not so much where you guys are. <laughs> For a lot of the country right now, it's cold. Um, but, uh, you know, it's dark. It's, or, you know, it was before the time changed, but, but it will get dark again, you know, again, more of where we are in the north. <laughs> but uh, guys, you make me all jealous about Florida right now. <laughs> but, but it's hard. In the morning, it's hard to get out of bed and just like do stuff, right? You want to stay in bed naturally. To, to, to uh, Marsha's point, it's more pleasurable. It's more enjoyable. It's easier, actually. All right. Reduce friction. Add an activating prompt or cue. And you're more likely to just fall into the behavior. Now, when I started this habit out, I wasn't doing the amount that I'm doing now. I was doing, um, it's actually just this little park close-ish to our house. Um, it takes me about five minutes, do a little loop around it, and back to the house. And I thought I, at that point, I had this kind of weird ankle. I thought it was an injury, but it was really just a strengthening stretching problem as a physical therapist suggested. And it, and it worked every time I was able to kind of work out the issue. Um, so I started walking, not running. Um, but over time, this became a 20 minute run and it grew into a fully formed habit over time. All right, another key insight that I started realizing is the main thing that trips me up from this in the morning. Any guesses? Kids. Oh, kids, that is a good guess. That is a guess. That's probably the second main thing that trips me up. We'll get to kids in a sec. Uh, checking the phone. Checking the phone, emails. Emails. Because you never know what's going to be in there. And oh man, that email can get pretty exciting sometimes. <laughs> um, uh, but it somehow feels exciting, even though it's not, but whatever. But then there's the news, you know, and then of course there's, you could check social media or, you know, you could do, you know, there's texts, you know, maybe there's something from WhatsApp. Maybe it's a family member that's abroad. Who knows? But the point is like, there's always stuff to check. Okay. I want that thing far away from me. I don't want to charge it next to my bed for sure. I don't even want to charge it in the bedroom. And ideally, I don't necessarily want to charge it in my bathroom next to the bedroom either, because, you know, I've got to go to the bathroom first thing in the morning. And sure enough, I can get hung up, you know, check in after, you know, go to the bathroom. And then suddenly you're just like, oh, let's just check the email or whatever. No, no, no. I want that thing next to the door where I'm leaving for the run. Right. So I'm, so I'm, I'm distancing, physically distancing the thing that's going to be an obstacle to getting out the door. And I'm, I'm, I'm the, the principle here is friction. I'm decreasing friction for the things that are going to help me do the behavior. I'm increasing friction for the things that are going to trip me up. Right. Friction is actually Wendy Wood's estimation of the power of friction is it's probably one of the most important and poorly under, not poorly, but underutilized tools in our habit forming toolkit. In other words, we just assume it's about willpower. You know, I'm just like, yeah, I'm awesome or, or whatever. I don't know. But no, it's like really like make it easy to do the behavior you want to do and make it hard to do the behaviors you don't want to do. Ben and Jerry's in the freezer. If you really don't want to eat Ben and Jerry's, take that Ben and Jerry's that's half eaten. Run it under some hot water until it's melted and dump it down the drain. Put it, I know it was hard, wasn't it? And then put, put it in the garbage can and tell yourself you can have Ben and Jerry's, just not in the house. That's different. It doesn't say never. It just says not in this little, um, you know, sacred space called my home. Like I drew a little, uh, 
like electronic fence. It's almost like, you know, you know, like dogs have little electronic fences sometimes. It's just an ice cream fence. You know, you can have it outside of that ice cream fence, but just not at home. That's friction. Trust me, you will eat ice cream way less, way less. You'll be shocked at how well it works. I call this principle geofencing actually, because there's this digital way to do that, where you geofence a, an area and just, just say, oh, I can have this thing, just not in this location. And typically that location is our work and our home and our cars. You know, those are the places we spend the most time. Um, so, so just make those non-negotiable. And then just like you can have it other times and it will cut how much you take in something by, oh my gosh, sometimes it's like 80 or 90%. It's shocking. All right, consistency beats intensity. Number two, oh, by the way, kids, if my kids do get up, like my nine-year-old, she will get up sometimes with me. And again, consistency beats intensity. So my normal run now is about a 20 minute run. It's about two miles. It's, you know, it just is what it is, but it's quite a lot for her, obviously. I say, if she gets up with me, I have a choice. I have a choice to be like with her, which is a relationship priority, or to stick with the habit. Sometimes habits and relationships come in conflict. Very normal and very natural. Often there's a creative solution if you embrace the idea of mini habits to go down a level and say, hey, you want to get on your bike and come with me? Or do you want to, do you want to jog? Like, which one? If she wants to do a little joggy with me, then we go for five minutes around the block. If she wants to do a bike, typically I can do my whole run. It depends on how much time we have. But the point is there's usually a flexible solution and doing it counts, right? So suddenly I've got like different sizes of the habit, all of which count as having done it. I'm going a little bit beyond mini habits right now, but they call these elastic habits where you have a small, medium, and large version of the same behavior. So in my case with the running habit, it's five minutes, 20 minutes, or 40 minutes. That's it. I've got a small, medium, and large. In some days, I can only get the small, but something is always better than nothing. And if consistency is what's actually the more important thing when it comes to habit formation, then I'm getting it right. The all or nothing thinking trap is really what trips us up. All right, number two, many habits build confidence. There's this growing sense that I'm getting somewhere, that I'm winning, that I'm doing well, right? And that's exciting because it builds something inside called self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is your belief in your ability to influence an outcome. It's like, how likely am I to be successful at this behavior? If you have a lot of it, you're going to persist through the obstacles and the difficulties that are inevitably going to come up. But if your self-efficacy is pretty low, you'll probably give up when you hit those obstacles. So self-efficacy is like a, the magic elixir of motivation. And with clients, I'll often ask them, okay, now you've, we've sort of laid the groundwork for what you're hoping to do over the next you know, couple of weeks. Let's just like talk about like how confident you are that you feel like it's gonna go well this time. No right or wrong. It's just like an honesty, like gut level thing. What do you think? One to 10. Sometimes they'll be like, yeah, no, like they'll usually overshoot it a little because they're really excited. But they'll be like, no, I'm a seven, definitely. And they'll be like, okay, so you feel like you're about a seven. Oh, yeah, well, I mean, maybe I'm a five. You know, they'll sometimes they'll correct. But sometimes they'll be like, oh, God, now that you say it like that that I'm likely to actually succeed for real. Um, I'm probably a four, maybe a three. Okay, cool, great. As a coach, it's like, I don't care where you are, but it's like the lower the number, the more critical mini habits become. Because with mini habits, it's not about the size of the habit, it's about the consistency of the habit. And once they start feeling the consistency, guess what surges? Confidence. Confidence, their confidence, pleasure. Their confidence, their self-efficacy. So there's a very famous psychologist. A lot of you probably know this guy. His name's Albert Bandura. Sorry, I'm, <laughs> there he is. Um, uh, who, who studied self-efficacy at the end of his life, or end of, end of his career. He's still alive, actually. 
Um, he wanted to know how you build self-efficacy because what he found was this is kind of the secret ingredient. People have a lot of it. They'll persist through the difficult times and they really will be successful at achieving their goals. And guess what he found the answer was after a lot of research. It's like one thing. That's it. It's like drum roll, please. 10 years later, small successes, small wins. That's what people need in order to build and grow that sense of confidence or self-efficacy that they can do it and they can do it again. It's like, it's much, it's almost like momentum is what you're building. It's like a flywheel. You're getting the flywheel going. And once it's really rolling, they're so filled with a sense of joy and confidence that they're succeeding that they're going to keep persisting. All right, there's this lovely story uh, about Jerry Seinfeld, uh, um, this very funny human, um, who there was somebody who asked Jerry how he became so funny, a young comedian. And Jerry said, well, I just, you know, I just write jokes every day. And the young comedian, not terribly thrilled with the answer, said, well, thanks, Jerry. We, I think we all do that. Come on, man, give us your, uh, there's got to be more in there than that. And he's like, no, I, I mean, I know it sounds boring, but like, that's really what I do. And he goes, well, I do have this little routine, this little ritual I do. I actually, every day that I write jokes, I put a big red X on that day and then I move on with my day. So in like one fell swoop, Jerry Seinfeld <laughs> cuts through like all the noise right to the science and says, if you can display visual progress, it works like a feedback loop and motivates you even further. And then he said this to the young comedian, after a few days, you'll have a chain. Just keep at it and the chain will grow longer every day. You'll like seeing that chain, especially when you get a few weeks under your belt. Your only job is to not break the chain. So there's this really important psychologist, her name's Teresa Mabel, she's at uh, Harvard Business School. She calls this the progress principle. When you see visual progress, visual, how you have to see it, it's one of the deepest wellsprings of motivation. So tracking, creating a tracking system, which is what this is, and displaying it visually, not just keeping it in your head, is not just good for accountability and honesty. More importantly, it's good for motivation because it tells you I'm winning. I'm succeeding. And again, if you elasticize a habit and have a small, medium, and large version, even if you're sick, your kid's barfing on your shoe, you've got like, you know, a thousand like disasters and catastrophes happening all around you. Typically speaking, you can still do the smallest version of your habit. Many habits, generally speaking, take one to five minutes. One to five minutes. That's the average. That's how small we're talking about. So it's 11.38 p.m. at night and you're exhausted. You usually can still meditate for three minutes, right? That's the kind of thing we're talking about. All right, many habits build motivation, partly by building confidence and, and what that does to motivation through self-efficacy. But another way many habits build motivation is because motivation tends to follow action. This part about motivation, just mind-bending. Motivation tends to follow action. So your brain is like, oh, I don't feel like it. Let's go work out. Oh, I just don't feel like it. Exactly. That's why you should go work out. Because once you start working out, you'll suddenly start feeling like it. But you have to start in order to feel like it. That's what's so confusing about motivation. We don't feel like doing much of anything until we're in the middle of it. Brains hate starting, but they love continuing. Try this out with your inbox. Next time you have a, a double digit, or sorry, double digit, what am I saying? Triple digit inbox. <laughs> Put a timer on. Do it for five minutes. Do it for 10. 10 is usually the better number with an inbox, but even if you can only do it for five. See how it's like, it's like the Olympic games of the inbox, uh, you know, competition. So, so like, see how many uh, emails you can get rid of in 10 minutes. And then at the end of the 10 minutes, you can walk away from the inbox. But you might want to continue because you just got rid of like all the junk. And that was like 57 emails you just cleared out. Holy cow, in 10 minutes. Mm, now you're onto something. Brains hate starting, but they love continuing. 
So shrink the size, which is what many habits do, and then see if you want to continue once you're already doing. All right, many habits grow. Like I said, they kind of do this backdoor thing to building a bigger habit. How do they do that? In part through what BJ Fogg calls bonus reps. So BJ Fogg would do his two push-ups, And then if he felt super motivated, he would throw on, you know, 10, 15, 20 more. That's how his habit started growing. That's why it grew. So bonus reps are really powerful. Um, again, if you're adding this sort of elastic habits dimension, you can also have like a preset small, medium, and large version. So you can bounce between those different versions depending on the difficulty and the curveballs of the day. All right, number four, mini habits build willpower. So that willpower battery that depletes and gets really exhausted by the end of the day. Yes, you can get a bigger battery. It's like the, well, it's, I don't even know what iPhone number we're on. What are we on? Like 12, 11, 13? I don't know. I'm like way back 14. in dinosaur land. Are we 14? Oh, shoot. See, I'm like, what? I don't even know what I am, eight or not eight. I think, I don't know. But my battery is pretty bad. <laughs> all right. I need a new battery. We all need new batteries. Okay. Habit formation. This process of getting better at our habits increases our willpower capacity. So it drains less quickly. It's just like a perk like a side benefit of habit formation. All right, number five, many habits boost autonomy, which is another way of saying they, they maintain our sense of freedom or choice. And they're also very flexible. BJ Fogg says many habits are small and flexible instead of big and brittle. I like that. So you can take them on vacation, they don't break. All right, why? These are the three tips, the three kind of concluding tips for why, how to set up your mini habits. Number one, it's probably the most important sentence of the whole time we have today. I would definitely write this down. After I blank, then I will blank. They call this habit stacking or pairing. In the research, it's called pairing. You're just literally piggybacking a new baby habit on top of an existing habit. And trust me, you have existing habits you, you might not think of them as habits, but brushing your teeth is a habit. Eating breakfast is a habit. Getting your car is a habit. You're more, you know, getting dressed is a habit. Showering is a habit. You know, those are the kinds of things that it's very easy to piggyback new things on top of. Um, after I step out of the shower, then I will write three things I'm grateful for in my gratitude journal. After I park in my at my office then i will listen to my five minute headspace meditation while i still have some privacy in my car after i open the fridge then i will eat one carrot stick <laughs> boring did you say wait wait you boring. To, did you say boring marcia oh i'm so glad you used that word. it is boring Go ahead. Think, carrot yeah. stick marcia Maybe the little hummus. <laughs> okay. Exactly. <laughs> Great. Carrot sticks and the hummus pre-cut, <laughs> or maybe the baby carrots, but pre and, and the hummus like right there. Great. So reduce the friction. It can't be in the little like pull-out drawer, you know, the cooler drawer or whatever where you put the veggie. No, no, no. It's got to be eye level. Reduce the friction automatically, unconsciously. Every time you do it, eat the carrot stick or the cucumber or whatever the favorite veggie is. All right. If you set it up this way the likelihood that you'll actually follow through on the behavior will go from, no kidding, 33% to 75%. So if you don't set it up with this structure, you're like, mm, you know, 33% likelihood is what the science shows uh, to follow through, to actually follow through with your intention. But if you do set it up this way, it jumps to 75% likelihood that you follow through. That's a massive change. It's a massive change. All right, celebrate progress. When we do the thing, even if it's small, give yourself the credit. Give yourself the sort of, um, I did something hard, or I just stuck with it, or I was consistent, and consistency is the most important things when it comes to habits. Celebrate the progress. It releases dopamine, and dopamine accelerates the rate at which you form habits. So this isn't just a feel-good strategy. This is a, I want to lock this habit in quicker strategy. Celebrate progress. All right, last one. 
how many at a time? People ask me this a lot. Um, with mini habits, two to four. Typically three is my favorite number with mini habits. Um, this is a willpower question. With normal sized habits, medium or large, uh, one to two habits at a time. Uh, but again, if it's an elastic habit, you know, and you're using that kind of system of a small, medium, and large of each kind, uh, usually two or three. You can focus on two or three, so it keeps it kind of interesting, but not overwhelming. Okay. All right, we're we're a little we're a little close on time, but let's try this. Let's do breakout rooms. Here's the oh shoot, I I did a a PDF. I created a PDF, which is a summary of this the presentation today. So if anybody would like um, a, the it's like a it's like an infographic of that. Feel free to text the word habit to the to the number four four one four four. And that should spit you back um, uh, a, a PDF. Okay, here's what I want to do in the breakout rooms. Choose one mini habit and create one after then plan. That's it. So this is just an experiment this week that I want you to try. Choose one mini habit and then structure it in it. After I blank, then I'll blank plan. Does that seem clear enough? Each person will have three minutes to describe what they're going to do to the other person. Feel free to discuss or coach each other, and then we'll reconvene. Okay. All right, we are ready, Karen. Uh, for those who are who are those who are back. Um, oh, are, we're still waiting for a few. I'm, is that right, Karen? Because there, there's like the sixty second grace period or whatever. If not, let's let's go ahead and start the conversation. Um, what came up a, as you were discussing the after then plans, as well as the um, if there are the uh, mini habits? What what came up in the discussions? Um, limiting use of technology. Okay. That's a good one. That's cool. Lim limiting use of technology is the habit. So the yeah the habit was um, using technology in the morning, and so okay. the new habit was to um, replace instead of reaching for the phone, to replace it with um, making the bed because that's where um, they were using the the technology the most. So they made mm -hmm. the bed; they were less likely to get back in bed. To get back in the bed. Yeah. Smart. <laughs> I, it. I love it. Mine is similar. Uh, I did a, a like. Uh, when I eat a meal, I will not use my phone. Ooh, good. Good. I like uh, that. And, and no more, no more phone in the bathroom either. TMI, <laughs> but. You're breaking the habit. You're really breaking the habit. Man, I'll Jim tell you what. It's fast now. <laughs> Jimmy's, Jimmy's doing push-ups in there instead. That's exactly. right. That's right. <laughs> Forget to. Exactly. We're doing two with eight bonus reps. All right. <laughs> Mine is a bit related to um, my transition into coaching from a bit of a fast paced career and um, way of being. And it was that after I receive a question, I will take a 15 second pause. I love that. Ah, it's a long pause. No, I love that. That is so cool, Shakti. 15? That would be impossible for me. <laughs> it, might, it might be a long pause. I'm not quite sure. I thought it through like 15 Five, seconds. Six would be a long <laughs> but the point is to build a pause. I have to, I have to see yes. what, what length of time. Yeah. Well, it, it, the pause is for you, Shakti, to sort of consider the response and work through it, but instead of just jumping in, you're thinking? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not so much the thinking through, it's the... Yeah, thinking through actually being. It's Ooh. not it's, it's actually getting out of my head and into the body and connecting with the person. So, so because this is where I needed in coaching, this is where I'm finding that I want to make that my second nature in coaching in my career now, which was not my career, not the way of being. Mm -hmm. in banking right people really you know that wasn't really not really looked for <laughs> so. that's 
Test awesome. it out and just see if the other person doesn't feel uncomfortable. If it's an overly long pause, the other person might feel awkward. So try it out and see what really works. Yeah, well, but Marsha, th- yeah. that's when the other person, like in that 15 seconds, they admit to having an affair, you know? Because <laughs> <laughs> they're simply so uncomfortable with the... Uh... Well, I read something recently that actually said, if you pause a little bit longer, it encourages the other person to elaborate more on what they're saying. They'll give you more information. So I'm hoping that could be useful, but I I just, my instincts are telling me there's a fine line between a pause, a long pause, and one that's so overly long, the other person starts to feel awkward. So you'll have to test that out and see what works. It's three to seven seconds is what the research shows. Three to second, said. seven. Okay, so I, I was seven. double on it. Okay, it's so longer. Gonna... It's long. when you're silent, it's it really seems like a long period of time. Just like if you forget a word, you're getting a speech. You know, mm-hmm. it could be, I always said as a kid, I forgot my lines. It might have been ten seconds, but it felt like two hours. Totally. Okay. Thank three you for that. Thank James, you for that. what was that three three to seven seconds to what to till. To, to so, get, so, so a lot of the research that has been done on this is around uh, teachers or facilitators facilitating like a group discussion or a classroom or something. And what it what the actual research is, is, is asking the question to the group, waiting three to seven seconds until people will actually raise their hands and respond. Got it. I heard it was up to nine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. We saw that just when we came back from the breakout rooms. It's about three seconds before <laughs> someone spoke up. Yeah, it's much longer than we usually feel comfortable waiting. And so it's a skill to like let that time, getting good at the discomfort in yourself to let that time elapse, to allow them to really think it through and then come up with what they want to say. Mm-hmm. Cool. All right. Um, I want to make sure we stop on time. Um, I know there's probably more here to discuss. By the way, I'm more than happy to take this offline if anybody has questions or whatever. Uh, my email is just james at brain by design. Dot com. So happy always to answer questions uh, there or, or wherever. Um, but be- before we go, I just want to make sure I, I give you guys this. This What we did here is part of this broader uh, course series um, that, that I run every uh, eight weeks. So the next one will be in January. Um, but uh, it's, uh, let me see if I can, where is it? Okay, there it is. Um, it's a, it's a pretty robust experience on the neuroscience around coaching. So it's called brain science for coaches. Uh, it's 30 ICF CCEs. So it, it does help you in renewing or achieving a next level in your credentialing with ICF. Um, there's a discount code. So South Florida is a discount code for 200 bucks off. The next one will be again in January. Um, uh, happy to answer any questions about that, uh, you know, offline or whatever, if, if there's interest there. Um, it's, a, it's really, as you can tell, I really try to bridge the, what do we know from the science and how does that really apply? How do we work with that with clients? A quarter of it's on habits, a quarter of it's on productivity and the science around productivity and uh, getting things done and just dealing with distraction and that sort of thing. Quarter of it's on overcoming fear and anxiety and stress, that kind of stuff. And then a quarter of it's on the science of happiness uh, and positive psychology. So That's it's really cool. kind of a, a whirlwind tour of all those topics. So again, if anybody's interested in that, um, feel free to, uh, to to let me know. And I'll just put that link in the- uh, are, are you instructor, James? Say that. Am I the instructor? Are you the instructor on this program? I am the instructor. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. All right. Any, I think we're probably at time, Karen. I don't, I don't want to go over. Um, looks like uh, any, anything else you need to say to wrap up. Oh, I think you're muted. Excellent. Karen. Thank you so much. Oh, sorry. I'm so sorry. I thought I did unmute myself. I apologize. I said anything else that Jimmy has to add about ICF South Florida, I will let him do that. But James, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. I appreciate I am a, as Jimmy knows, I am a brain science geek. I love it. (laughs) And so um, I really appreciate all that and the help that you gave us tonight. Thank you.